So, hi and welcome to the Vivimat Q&A event. I'm your host, Stefan Eder. And as you can see down here in the corner, we are live today. Anything could happen. Well, we're almost live as there's a 20 second delay. And right now I'm just killing time to make sure that the stream actually also pops up on YouTube. Uh, you may or may not have noticed that I gave myself a Corona buzz cut since we last met, which for me is just an ordinary haircut. But with this beard, it looks like something like the Heisenberg from Breaking Bad, I guess. Uh, yeah, we're online. Good. I can see myself. Uh, so now I can do the actual text. Um, can't believe we actually managed to get 78% of our speakers to join us today. So with us today are Ashley Martini, Jean Pietro Moras, Jean Francois Molinari, Chiara Gattinoni, Lars Pastewka, Clelia Rigi, and Christian Greiner. They are all currently hiding behind this Vivimat curtain that you see around me. Uh, uh, together with my co-host Carsten Gachot, the professor of tribology at the TU Wien, who will be doing a lot of the emceeing today while I'm sweating through three t-shirts to keep this live stream going. It's a first for me, but hey, you live, you learn. Unfortunately, uh, Lucia Nicola and Martin Dienweber can't be with us today, but they said they'd record a short video answering their questions and send them to us soon, or in the worst case, just uh, answer the questions uh, below their uh, videos. So to all of you viewers out there, uh, while the preferred mode to ask questions was to leave them in the comment section below the respective video, you may certainly ask additional questions in the live chat of this stream. So the live chat should be somewhere. No, it's, is it? Yeah, I think it's somewhere up here. Yeah. Um, so uh, just make sure that before you ask a question, you let us know who you would like to address that question to. So I guess enough babble. Uh, let's welcome our speakers. Uh, here they are, should be visible any moment now. And over to you, Carsten. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, first of all, for the very nice uh, organization of this um, Vibrimet um, YouTube channel format. I'm very glad um, and I also would like to send a big thank you to our speakers um, for their excellent presentations and also that they um, followed our invitation to uh, give a talk in this uh, very nice format. And um, I'm also very glad, of course, that they found the time today um, for our Q&A event, uh, which is live streamed on YouTube. Well, first of all, um, as I said, um, challenging times throughout the year. So many of the conferences have been um, canceled or postponed to the upcoming year. And I hope that at least um, the upcoming year will not be too busy and crowdy with all the postponed conferences and the regular ones taking place. Um, I'm very much looking forward also to meet um, most of you uh, live again during some of the tribology conferences. That would be really great um, because um, we know that these formats are very nice, but um, they cannot, of course, replace um, the personal contact and the, the live meeting at the conference place. So anyway, we try to make the best out of it um, during this year. And um, I'm, I'm very glad that we found an excellent bunch of speakers our format and I would like to start um, today with um, the, the first questions to our speaker Professor Ashley Martini from UC Merced. Um, she's also the one who has to leave a little bit earlier today. Well it's still early in the US, very early in the US, but uh, she has some other appointments so I would like to first thank you again Ashley for, for um, taking also part in this, um, in this format and um, I would like to um, ask you some of the questions raised by the people who viewed your presentation. Well, first of all, um, you talked about trifilm lubricants, especially nickel-doped um, MOS2. And there was a question from uh, one colleague who said, okay, do you think that uh, heat generated in the contact has any influence on the widening mechanism um, that you observed? Um, thank you. Thanks for including me in this excellent program and, and that's, a, that's a really good question. It actually got us thinking. So I'm gonna not totally answer it, but just let you know the path that we've been thinking down so far. Um, flat, you know, flash temperature rise, generally speaking, can be approximated. There are various equations, but they all involve thermal conductivity. So for our model system where we have a you know, very thin MOS2 layer on a 440C, we have three different thermal conductivities at play. We have the thermal conductivity across the the layers, thermal conductivity along the layers of the MOS2 and then of the substrate itself. So um, I, I will 
be totally transparent here and saying we don't exactly know how to handle that and how to estimate the flash temperature. So quantitatively, um, I'm not sure what kinds of temp what what uh, magnitude temperatures we're experiencing locally in the contact. Having said that, I expect there is some temperature rise and it very well could contribute to the mechanisms, the wear mechanisms that we were proposing. But that was a really great question. Okay, thank you. Um, when you when you presented um, the, the role about the nickel was not really clear to me. What would you say from the metallurgical point of view or the material science point of view, what is the particular role of the nickel? Because you said it may generate larger debris or easier debris. In, in which perspective does that nickel somehow interact with grain boundaries or and, and, and prittle them, imprittle them, or what, what is the actual scenario there, what you could think of? Karsten, why don't you give me some easy questions, like some low softballs over the plate <laughs> to start this event off, right? Uh, that's a really good question as well. And again, one I probably won't entirely answer. Um, the role of the role or the effect of dopants on MOS2 in general is not well understood. You know, there's a lot of, <clears throat> there are many studies that have reported increased hardness, but not always. Some, some studies show decreased hardness. Um, there are proposed mechanisms associated with the dopants actually segregating into different phases. We, we suspect, first of all, that there is a hardening effect, um, mm -hmm. not one that we focused on here since we were looking at other mechanisms, but but our, our inference is that the nickel is changing the wear mechanism. So something on the microstructure level, as you suggested, is changing such that the wear happens in a different, through a different pathway. Exactly what that is, um, I, exactly how the nickel causes that change in the wear mechanism is cer certainly something for future study. Okay, yeah, that sounds very exciting. Well, maybe to, to end up with, a, <laughs> let's say, much easier <laughs> question in that context. Um, uh, what about actually temperature effects? Um, uh, one, one colleague asked, are the, the results also consistent at the cold temperature of space? Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit tough, but um, at least for, let's say, lower temperatures, um, have you any experience in that? Or have you, have you also done with your team some tests in that perspective? That's, a, that's another good question. We actually have not done cold temperature tests. However, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point because it's, uh, it's very relevant to the application that we were considering. But one of the other advantages of nickel as a dopant over other possible dopants is its low temperature performance. <clears throat> there were several studies in, uh, a few years back, more than a few now, um, where, where different MOS2 dopants were directly compared across a range of temperatures. And it was actually shown that all of the, the friction always goes up with decreasing temperature for all of the dopants but the least change in friction with decreasing temperature was exhibited by the nickel doped samples. So we ourselves didn't study that, but indeed that's one of the reasons to consider nickel as an ideal dopant for these space applications. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, yeah. Thanks, um, then we would already move on to our next speaker. And um, I selected Chiara, Chiara Gattinoni from ETH Zurich to be um, the next colleague to be asked some questions. Um, Chiara was talking about the secret life of lubricant additives. Very interesting talk, very um, exciting. So um, one colleague asked actually, if it would be thinkable to apply your method to comparably benign alloy systems such as copper nickel, for example. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, obviously, um, as I said, you know, the the method is quite um, heavy in terms of computational time. So the more complex you make a system, the more computational time you need. So there is obviously an upper boundary. Um, but I think like a, a reasonably um, easy alloy that we understand the chemistry of, so that one can actually have chemical intuition of how sort of the system will behave. And another important factor is if there's also experimental comparison, then one can really, uh, you know, make the systems also a bit, a bit more complex, complex than what I've shown. Mm -hmm. um, would you, would you expect also in in such a type of system like copper nickel because of the ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetic properties of of the nickel, some complications, or would you say no, that is not a big deal? Um, no, I think I think this type of alloys are like routinely studied, also with density functional theory. So you know we can deal uh, we can deal well with magnetism. 
um, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it would be a bit more complex, but I think um, it's more that you have maybe more absorption sites, like non-equivalent absorption sites, that makes the thing more more complicated uh, mm -hmm. because you just have to more of uh, have more degrees of freedom of where the molecules and how the molecules could absorb. Okay. Okay. Um, you, you showed one slide where you presented copper atoms on top of a 111 surface. And uh, there was a question about um, what about more roughness, uh, somebody asked. And uh, could you study, for example, how the step of a one monolayer island uh, might crack open the molecular film and uh, reduce the inhibition performance? So, uh... <laughs> Maybe, but I mean, we are limited in the size of the systems that we can do. So I personally think that a better approach is an approach that we used, uh, and by we, I mean myself and the group of Daniele Dini at Imperial College for some uh, friction modifiers on hematite, where we did the density functional theory study on uh, a small system without roughness and just looking at you know the geometries and the dissociation and you know all the things that uh, we thought required uh, molecular dynamics treatment and then we kind of use this information to parameterize a classical potential and then study really more way more complex problems like for example roughness or the interaction with the lubricant or whatnot with the mm -hmm. with a higher level of theory so i think the way to do you know, to add this level of complexity, which requires bigger system is to kind of go on a sort of multi-scale type of study. So kind of understand the system from a very accurate sequential multi-scale. So first understanding that point of view, and then using this information to make the system bigger, but still accurate. Okay. Um, a final question could be, um, you said something about how to improve um, specifically benzotriazole, um, and you mentioned something like uh, engineering the surface. Could you maybe quickly please comment on what you mean by, by engineering the surface? Um, yes, so I, I'm not 100% sure what I mean, but um, so uh, we saw that uh, the um, different structures of the different amount of benzotriazole will be stabilized by a different of uh, copper atoms on the surface. So the mobility of the copper atoms is very, is very important. And so one thing, for example, is one manages to uh, induce a surface reconstruction on copper 111. Um, somehow the, the mobility of these adaptons will be lowered and then the dimers will be favored over the chains, for example, because, um, because they need fewer adaptons. So, um, uh, uh, so that's, that's the only uh, experimental example that uh, comes to mind right now. Um, but I think, so what I mean is, uh, is really about um, how many adaptons can one have. So it could even just be making a surface and then depositing some extra clusters that maybe will be more mobile than uh, than just the bulk. Um, it's, it's about engineering how many adaptons you have available on the surface. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk and uh, we got a longer list of questions, of course. Um, some of them I, I picked, um, some of them just um, came to, to my attention today via mail. So I just picked up some of them, but um, there was a very productive um, discussion also uh, about your talk. And um, yeah, thank you again, Chiara, for the very nice presentation. Thanks um, for having me. We should, we should move ahead with uh, Gian Pietro Modas. Um, Gian Pietro is uh, working at the IWM in Fraunhofer Institute in Freiburg. And uh, Gian Pietro was talking about um, the in situ formation of uh, aromatic uh, tribal layers for super low friction. Um, Gian Pietro, there was a question about if you could expect um, such aromatic structures actually um, um, also to be beneficial for, for metal surfaces. And, and do you see actually potential in uh, using aromatic molecules in lubricants? So, uh, hi everybody, and uh, thanks for the very nice questions actually <laughs> they are not trivial questions 
Um, so the first part was about uh, if we can expect something like that to happen on metallic surfaces. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I would say if we had a surface like steel or iron, and uh, we have somehow carbon from the lubricant uh, chemistorbing uh, um, on the surface, and it forms a metal carbide, for example, like cementite, then my answer would be no. But I've seen Auger spectroscopy of uh, steel or cast iron surfaces after tribological load in some kind of oil. And I've seen um, data that uh, support the idea that uh, there might be a few nanometers of a carbon rich film on top of the surfaces, which contains almost no iron, for example. So in this case, it could be useful. So I would say the short answer is, um, it could be useful if we are able to form a stable carbon film on the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. And uh, regarding the the aromatic molecules in the lubricant, well, <clears throat> if you think that uh, all the things we have done so far is proving that uh, through the uh, tribological decomposition of the molecules, you are able to donate atoms to the surface, for example, oxygen to a carbon surface or carbon to a silicon nitride surface. And then this goes on. Uh, producing aromatic structures, then if the, the composition of the lubricant is an essential essential step, then I would say that it wouldn't be useful to, to have aromatic structures because A, you would have to decompose them and they are not longer aromatic, and second, they are chemically very stable, so you would need even higher pressure to achieve mm -hmm. um, the composition. Okay. So this is, I'm not sure because I've never simulated it, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, as, as far as I understood, I mean, you, you uh, showed tight binding approach and there was a question about uh, where would you actually expect an empirical um, reactive potential such as uh, Reax FF to produce considerably different results from that what uh, you get? Um, yes, this is also a very interesting question and uh, I can answer in this way. First of all, <clears throat> We don't take for granted that tight binding is good enough. This is the first step. Uh, so with tight binding, we are able to simulate uh, about 400 atoms for a time scale of a nanosecond. Uh, if you have a parallel code that runs on about 10 CPUs, it takes a month. So let's say a nanosecond a month uh, is a lot of computational time, but is affordable. With DFT, you wouldn't be able to do that, but this comes at a price. So you renounce transferability. Tight binding is not as transferable as DFT, it's not an ab initio method. And mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there are parameters, tight binding parameters for molecules or for solids. So the first thing we have to do is perform molecular dynamics with tight binding. And then every time we observe something interesting, we check with DFT. Is it an mm -hmm. exothermic reaction? Does it, does it, um, is it in agreement? And most, in most of the cases, there is a very good agreement. Mm -hmm. So now the next step, uh, this was a question from uh, Stefan, I guess, is uh, would, uh, why couldn't we use a FF potential? That would be way faster. So in this case, we even have to renounce explicitly electrons. And the problem is that uh, in such a system where you have carbon with many kinds of hybridization, you have oxygen, uh, we see a number of different chemical environments, amorphization of carbon, aromatization of the surface, dissociative chemisorption of water, and a variety of uh, oxygen carbon compounds like um, epoxidic groups, uh, ether groups, uh, hydroxyl atoms, and um, groups. So this is a very complex environment. And um, we tried using the XFF. We took three of them. And I must say, none of these potentials were developed for our system. So we cannot expect mm -hmm. it to work out of the box. And uh, basically, the, the answer is none of these potentials was able to describe all of this variety of chemical um, structures accurately at the same time. So one potential was mm -hmm. good for the oxygen termination, but not for the aromatization, and vice versa. So, mm -hmm. so using one, um, the solution would be probably to use our trajectories as a, a learning set to develop a new potential. 
but mm -hmm. uh, with what we've tried so far, you have to renounce uh, uh, too much accuracy and you wouldn't be able to see the, to obtain the same results. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the, for the very thank clear you. and detailed answer. Um, the next presenter in that bigger context is uh, Clelia Rigi from the University of Bologna. So nice to see you today, Clelia. Um, Clelia talked about the uh, advancing um, solid interfaces and lubricants by first principles, materials design. Um, and there was one question regarding the second part of your talk. And um, a colleague asked um, if he understood correctly that the entire table is actually based on uh, zero Kelvin. And how would a finite uh, temperature or even something realistic between 300 and 400 Kelvin affect your table? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, for sure, temperature has an effect on uh, the shear strength. Um, for example, uh, the uh, thermally activated the vibration of the atoms at the interface uh, will affect uh, the, the resistance to sliding. And this effect uh, uh, was estimated uh, by Kelly in the past, and uh, he predicted that for uh, copper, uh, iron, and tungsten, uh, this effect uh, will uh, decrease the um, uh, shear strength by 30%. And another effect that he mentioned was uh, uh, the, due to the possibility to nucleate uh, uh, tiny cracks uh, or uh, dislocation loops uh, by temperature. And uh, this uh, is, is said that this is uh, more important at higher temperatures. So he estimated an effect uh, from uh, room temperature to 1000 Kelvin degree, degrees. Uh, he predicted a decrease of 50% uh, of the shear modulus. Uh, of the um, uh, shear strength. Uh, but these are uh, rough estimates. So uh, as far as I know, these are the only two uh, uh, studies that I, that I know uh, about the effect of temperature on the shear strength. So it, uh, it, it would be a nice uh, topic of research to evaluate uh, the, de the dependence of the shear strength on, uh, on temperature. Uh, uh, nevertheless, our data at zero temperature, uh, I think that are useful to uh, represent uh, an upper limit uh, for the strength of a material. So it's useful to know which is the, the maximum strength that you can expect for a material to have a number, a, an accurate number, and uh, to be able to compare among different materials and for example, uh, to make predictions, for example, by the uh, considering the ratio between the shear strength and the cleavage strength, you can predict if a material will fail in a ductile way or in a brittle way. And, uh, uh, and we will also consider how this shear strength will be modified by chemical surface modifications. So if we can achieve selected value of uh, adhesion and friction, uh, in shear strength, maybe you can see how these um, date numbers at zero temperature are modified if you put some elements on the surface. So I think that you can obtain a lot of information even considering these ideal values at zero temperature because they are intrinsic characteristic of the materials and knowing them is useful. But anyhow, the, the, the question was, uh, was very meaningful because uh, in reality, of course, you have to consider the, the temperature and uh, uh, yes, th there is room for, uh, for uh, uh, new studies in, in this uh, direction because uh, as I said, I don't know any uh, previous uh, uh, systematic study and prediction of uh, the shear strength as a function of temperature apart from those that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, there was also some kind of um, additional question in the same context, and so it was asked if you could imagine some sort of temperature scaling. Yeah, for, um, for sure, increasing the temperature, uh, yes, the, the, the shear strength, uh, because uh, like uh, 
uh, Arrhenius, uh, I mean, if you see the, the event of uh, onset of sleep as uh, a, a thermally activated event, of course, you have to expect an attempt frequency uh, that you may eventually calculate by first principle calculation to uh, an, um, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, behavior like uh, uh, an activated event to, to be included in, in the description. So, yeah, I would imagine something like, uh, yeah, Arrhenius uh, behavior mm -hmm. or something like that. Okay, thank you very much, Clelia. There were not more questions. Maybe people were a little bit afraid of asking in this more complicated field, some specific questions, but uh, thanks again for, for the nice presentation. And also thank you for participating today for answering at least uh, this question about the temperature effects. Um, in this context, I would like to move on with uh, Jean-Francois Molinari from uh, EPFL. And uh, Jean-Francois actually received a couple of questions, um, but um, actually I will just pick out maybe uh, two questions that um, appear um, interesting to me. So um, one colleague asked if the first layer of material um, has been removed during the severe wear regime and big particles were removed from the surface, um, wouldn't this result in a much rougher surface and the wear mechanism would change actually again? Yes, uh, absolutely. So first of all, Karsten and Stefan, many thanks for, for hosting us. It's a really a pleasure to, to have this uh, forum. Um, at a time where we don't have chances to meet at conferences and discuss right in a, in a normal way. So ab absolutely, um, you know, um, in my opinion, the, this way of looking at, a, at a, the mechanisms behind where I, I'm coming from mechanical engineering, very macroscopic, we look at this at a, at a debris formation level in a very simplistic, simplistic setting. Uh, well, there are many more, much more questions left unanswered than, than one that we can answer. So indeed, we looked at a, at a single debris or two debris that we form, and we're looking at the onset of wear. But as you accumulate debris, you emerges from this process the creation of surface roughness. That's something that, to me, is still fascinating. We still try to understand this. And then as the process evolves, we start to develop what is called a tribal layer. A gauge, if you come from the geophysics or mechanics community, or a third body, um, there's different terms for this. And as you develop this pest, right, um, uh, mechanisms keep, keep changing. And, and to me, that's a completely open territory um, to look at it not um, in, a, in an experimental way, because of course, a lot of groups are, are looking less in great details, but to, to get a, a simple mechanistic understanding with simulations is a, is a is a challenge, it's not cookie, and uh, we're trying to look at this now. But mechanisms change, and um, there's an evolution in history that, and we have only scratched the surface. If mm -hmm. I can say so. There was there was also a question in this in in this um, yeah topic about um, one colleague said, well, the transition from um, actually uh, mild to severe wear is somehow well described, um, but what about the transition from low to mild wear? Um, in the volume, in the wear volume overload curve, it seems that the location of the transition is rather arbitrary. And which criterion can be used actually to determine if one is just below or just above the transition point? What would you say here? So in, in the figure you refer to in this question is, is really a schematic. And, um, you know, aiming to represent general experimental data that would represent the behavior of uh, debris production for an interface that will have uh, many, many asperities. And, and the link between the, uh, what we looked at at a single asperity and the link to the upscaling to a real interface with many with asperities is not, is not obvious. For at a single asperity, the transition from what we call low to mild and what we argue as a as a way to view severe wear is clear um, because either what we claim, either you have enough elastic energy in your system that you can form a debris, and then that's what we call malware, or you don't, 
Okay? And then you may have a, a thermally controlled um, uh, pulling out of atoms one by one, and that's what we call lower. So at the scale of a single asperity, we think it's well, uh, uh, we can rationalize this. Now, uh, going to the schematic in which we do macroscopic experimental data is a little less trivial. And for this, we need to call for probabilities and other means. Mm -hmm. And there are and people screwing behind me. My apologies for this, if you heard that. <laughs> it's my family. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a, a, a final quick question. Um, there was a question about if there is any kind of coupling between your phase field uh, approach to fracture and your large scale MD approach. Is there any kind of coupling between them? No, no. Um, we, you know, we, we, we have tools that can, that allows us to handle um, coupling between atomistics and um, and finite element modeling, coarse grain continuum approaches are much cheaper. So, so we have developed tools for this. But, but here we really, what I presented, I really just wanted to use phase field to probe in a much more efficient way uh, a material space of material parameters that in a, in a more e in an easier way because it's very hard with atomistic potential to 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 tune to decide you know what would be your um, Hardening coefficients, um, you know, strand hardening, strand rate hardening, and with plasticity, with continuum plasticity, those are very, you know, efficient phenomenological laws that we can we can tune. So that's why we turn fully 100% to phase field without copying to atomistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean Francois. It was a pleasure to to have had you on board uh, for for this format. Um, very nice. And um, then we are moving forward to Lars Pastewka um, from the University of uh, Freiburg. And uh, Lars talked about pattern formation in sliding metallic contacts. A very interesting topic, um, as I also worked with some colleagues, um, Carsten Boll, maybe, of course, you know Carsten from uh, also KIT and Ruth Schweiger. Um, we had uh, several discussions in that field. And um, yeah, I'm always surprised uh, to see the, the, the latest developments and, and progress in, 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 that, in that perspective. Um, well, there was um, a comment or question, more question um, regarding actually um, one colleague was wondering if you always need um, the interface roughness loss um, through the compression to form these vortices uh, while sliding or would the tilt of the lattice orientation actually be enough? That's an excellent question. <laughs> that I can, so I can tell you what we did. Uh, I can give you a definite answer uh, um, um, whether it's actually necessary. So we, we of course tried without interface roughness. So in, 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 as I showed in this in the talk, we created the interface roughness by compressing these multi-layer stacks, <laughs> and then it emerges naturally. And we also started from the original multi-layer stack. So, the, but that is a, of course then an um, almost perfect crystal of the. Um, copper and uh, and the gold layers, uh, we deformed it and we didn't see any um, any deformation. Now uh, my my hypothesis um, and and let me say that in these ca calculations, even though you have the information of every single atom, it's very difficult to to prove or disprove this hypothesis. Was that the dislocations get pinned uh, or get stuck at the interface between the between the um, two materials because of less lattice mismatch, and of course then you wouldn't need roughness. So what what I think is that on top of um, sort of uh, hardening or or making it difficult for dislocations to uh, cross these layers, uh, you need a nucleation process that sort of nucleates your your deformation. So you need a, a point where you have um, the stress is a little higher, so that you start um, nucleating these this waviness, and that for this process you need um, the interface roughness. Mm -hmm. Now, now, these are all, um, of course, all representative volume elements and the stress is homogeneous. In a real experiment, you would also have stress gradients. So it could be that the stress gradients would be sufficient to, to sort of nucleate um, this process. But this is something that we can't really do in, in MD calculations. I mean, um, my, my previous um, speakers here have alluded to this, that there's, of course, always a limit to system size. I mean, our calculations are uh, use effective interaction potential so we can do larger systems than if you use tight binding or dft but still we can't go to the experimental scale mm -hmm. okay um and then there was a question related to the eam potential you said it was tuned for your purposes and um, the question is um could you please go into a little bit more detail of what needed actually the tuning 
Yes, of course. I mean, um, so these, um, since you're looking at plasticity, I mean, you, what you want to look at is stacking faults um, and, um, and, and barriers for moving dislocations. So you want to, want to have a potential that gets your stacking fault energies right and these properties. And while um, there are potentials for pure copper and pure gold that are excellent, and those are also the ones that we base our potential on, uh, there was no copper gold alloy potential that actually gets stacking faults energies and these things right. So there's copper and gold potentials out there, and um, but they have terrible, I mean, they are terrible at reproducing stacking faults. They are okay at reproducing phase diagrams, um, but this is really not what you need for mechanics. So what we did, we took these two uh, potentials. The one was from potential from machine, the other one um, from uh, Kohola and coworkers, and we fitted a, a cross term um, to intermetallic phases, so to crystalline phases, and then we also computed the, the phase diagram of the copper gold system to see that we that we get the phases and the transition temperatures and things like this approximately right. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is always it's it's not perfect, but I think it's much better than what what used to be out there and and this was was specifically developed to be able to look at these copper gold layers mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Ruth Schweiger before she was also involved in this i mean this is sort of the, the nucleation point of this work was some experimental work of hers where she did this experimentally and she had looked extensively at this system and so this is why we sort of fine-tuned the potential for this material system and um, have you seen some material properties actually that are not reproduced as well with the tuned potential? Or would you say, no, it was then actually with the tuned potential, mostly was covered or? Yeah, but there's always done. something that's, that is wrong. Um, something, for example, I mean, getting, um, hitting transition temperatures is very difficult um, for transitions between, uh, between solid phases. And if you look at the phase diagram that's published in uh, the references in the talk, it's in, uh, in modeling and simulation materials. MS, MSE, uh, yeah, uh, and, and IOP journal. Uh, if you look at the phase diagram, the temperatures are all off. Um, I mean, they're not they're not spot on. For example, the transition temperatures, the melting points are okay at the um, for the pure phases, but then also in between, you see see differences. Whether that's important for the mechanics, of course, I don't know. It's always, of course, a balance between accuracy and of the potential and and calculation speed. If you want to be more accurate, you have to pay in computer time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Lars, for the clarification and uh, thanks again for the nice presentation. Um, then we move on to our last speaker for today's group. Um, this is Christian Kreiner from KIT. So Christian, nice to have you on board today. Um, we know each other already for, for many years. I'm always fascinated by the work your group is doing. Um, you actually talked about um, the subsurface um, deformation mechanisms in high purity copper. Um, and there was a question about the crane orientations in your sample visualized using ACOM. Um, so the apparent trend was the question from high, higher index orientations further down to much lower index orientations close to the sliding interface. Um, would you say that this is something from the perspective of a material scientist is somehow trivial or uh, is that some coincidence in this particular sample or what, what do you think about that? Thanks, Carsten. Yeah, it's really nice to be here. So thanks again to Stefan and yourself for putting this together. Um, that's a good question. It's not a coincidence. It's actually something that we are also in the process of looking into in a little bit more detail. Um, so I guess the, the person asking the question was wondering about the subgrains really forming at the surface, at the sliding interface. And there seems to be the trend that they are more one, one, one. Um, that's actually also something that we had seen in the past in, in a paper we published already four years ago, when you slide many times, not just once, that the surface in copper goes towards 111, not in the normal direction, which is to be expected as the closely packed plane, right? So that's basically with the lowest surface energy, so that's what copper wants to present to the surface. Um, this being said, it's a little bit more complicated, I guess, when you look in a little bit more detail, but that's ongoing work, and I, I don't know the the answer yet. And, and of course, it's true, it's all electron microscopy, so it's always a bit, bit difficult to get your statistics. But I don't think it's specific to this one temporal. We have mm -hmm. seen this over and over again. Mm -hmm. There's one question maybe which goes also a little bit into the direction of, of Lars again, um, because Lars showed uh, some, some 
yeah, slides about the gold nickel system and other system, but also, I mean, Christian, I know that you are looking on, on very different material systems. What, what would you, maybe Christian can answer that first, and if Lars has any further comment on that, please feel free. Um, what would you think of um, one of the metal physics um, descriptors like stacking fault energy would be interesting in terms of materials or alloys design, or especially these patterns um, that um, are formed um, under the sliding action, what Lars presented, how this is all in, uh, affected by the stacking fault energy. What, what would you say is the, this, this role of the stacking fault energy in, in that context? And could you think of maybe some, some specific alloy systems or materials that might be interesting to be studied further? I'm sure there's a lot to be learned there. And stacking fault energy definitely is an interesting descriptor. Um, as you might know, one, one of our now retired, but not really retired colleagues, Alphonse Fischer, um, always claims it's not a stacking fault energy. One should look at the E to A ratio, um, because that when that has a change in slope, if you start to alloy in certain systems at least, and that that is actually what you need to look at. Um, and actually we have, slightly ventured into this direction with uh, certain alloy systems you can actually change the e2a ratio without changing the stacking fault energy but you do change other properties like you of course harden the material right um so but definitely stacking fault energy is a good i still think it's a good parameter to study and to look in to look at in a little bit more detail yeah because what we would like to have of course are design guidelines and so then if, if there's a simple one like decrease the stacking fault energy or increase the stacking fault energy, that, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Lars, Lars anything you would like to Well, if it was that simple, someone else would have found it, right, already? Uh, that's true. <laughs> I, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so that's, it's, it's metallurgy. That's always a little bit of voodoo to me. I mean, Christian is a trained material scientist. So <laughs> it's not voodoo, but there's always a trade off, right? So, and, and, and those parameters are basically impossible to study independently because if you change one parameter, keeping all the others constant is not possible. And then right, you start to realize actually what you get is not an effect of, for example, second fault energy, it's an, it's an effect of hardening. Right, you also, also affect the microstructure, right, in all cases when you... Yes, uh, when you, and that so that's is when that, you then that. start to deal with grain size. So that's an idea we had. If we start to, if we add alloy elements that we then increase the, the grain size, so that basically uh, the whole patch effect then counterbalances the hardening effect from the substitute hardening. So, but it's, it's difficult, yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's it's very difficult to separate um, those effects um, as they um, influence each other. And of yeah. course, um, you cannot keep just one system constant and and completely neglecting all other parameters. It's a uh, it's a rather difficult, if not impossible, task. To be honest, from a material scientist perspective. So yeah, thanks again, Christian, and thanks Lars also for for this additional comment on this question. Then we are done with the, at least with the official part of the scientific questions. I think it's time to hand over to Stefan, who is uh, going to say a few words on a special issue in uh, MDPI materials. Stefan. Yeah, thank you all again for uh, doing this with us. Actually, uh, Lars and Christian, I think there's definitely a, a collaboration brewing here somewhere. And uh, I know we have, uh, we're going to talk next week about that. Uh, maybe we can uh, organize something to look into that together. Uh, but uh, while I'm having uh, everybody's attention before everybody tunes out again, uh, I'd like to promote this special issue of MDPI materials that I have the pleasure of guest editing. Uh, it's entitled Advances in Computational Materials Tribology and papers can be submitted well into the next summer. So there's plenty of time, no hurry. But um, thematically, it's uh, very close to this workshop here, but with a clear simulation angle. So it's more on the modeling side. Uh, and if you're interested, you can either scan this QR code. It's over here, yeah, over here. Scan the QR code on your cell phone or on your device. Uh, or you can click on the link that's in the comment section below. Uh, and with that, I think I can already go back to you speakers, Carsten wanted to have uh, one or two more questions uh, more out into the open, basically to everyone, a little free discussion. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Um, actually, um, what I was interested in and um, 
I invite everybody to comment on that. I would like to ask you a little bit about uh, your experience this year of these new popping up formats, what you actually liked most, what you did not like, what are your experiences in, in these um, old format series um, that we had this year due to the pandemic crisis. And also maybe if somebody wants to say a few words on the respective uh, future trends um, and perspectives in tribology in your um, own research field, I would be happy to um, to have your feedback, Lars. So, so, I, so I, I thought uh, uh, a little bit about uh, about what the what the effect would be of this of this pandemic, and I think for us as reasonably established scientists, it may not matter, right? We we have seen each other, we know each other, so you go into an online seminar and you reach a broader audience. But I think the big problem is that uh, the current PhD students, they don't get to network with their peers, right? If you think about us, I mean, we all went to the same conferences when we were PhD students, we met there and then you have your network and they all go up into a scientific career. But I think that's completely missing for this year. So I do think that these online formats have a place probably, but I don't think they will replace the networking character of, of real meetings in particular for the young folks. Um, so I think we will have to go back to actually meet in person at some point. Yeah, Lars, that is a good point. Um, actually, you're fully right. Um, for us, it's much easier than for the PhD students or the, the young, the very young scientists, as they still do not know, of course, um, the, the bigger guys and, and, and ladies. So it is very helpful, of course, to meet personally again, and that is an important point. Is there anybody else who want to say a few words on these formats, what you actually uh, liked or what was not going in the right direction, Jan Diedro? Uh, well, um, I perfectly agree agree with Lars, and, and um, maybe somebody has to. Uh, so there is also a practical and logistic aspect. That, uh, um, I see the, the two things going together because there might be room for um, events, even when before uh, logistics would have been difficult or costs because it costs money to organize a big conference or a workshop. So that is very handy to have something like that. Um, and uh, second, uh, I learned that uh, this thing is possible because, um, I mean, uh, before that, I didn't even think about the conference with 100 persons uh, simultaneously on, on, on in my living room. Um, having said that, I can't wait to go back to a conference because there are two ingredients missing. And one is the communication as uh, for new people as last said, then it's three. And uh, what I miss is adrenaline. Giving a talk before to a camera is not the same as being in a room and being a bit, uh, you know, nervous at the beginning and then delivering and, and uh, is something one has to try. And the second is fun. Um, I miss that aspect too. Yeah, thank you, John Gitro, that um, I also fully agree. It is a big difference if you present on stage and uh, 300 or 200 people are listening at once um, to your presentation. And although we might be all very professional and, and for many years doing this job, um, even for the best performers in the music, um, they also have this feeling of adrenaline, of course, and they feel a little bit nervous. And once they deliver, of course, um, that's perfectly fine. Um, and the other point, of course, is um, also to have the chats and the coffee breaks with the colleagues and to think out of new ideas and, and new projects, which are, of course, yeah, um, very much a shortcut now under this uh, situation. But Jean-Francois, what would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, so of course, I agree with, with all of you. Uh, uh, we just could talk about teaching as well, where one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching experience is much better when you see uh, students in front of you and not on Zoom. Um, but but I, I still think there are good things with, with the format that um, we discovered during, uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, and one of the good aspects is that it's um, quite democratic in the sense that we, um, it's fairly easy to attend. It is much cheaper. And, 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 and perhaps the future will be a mix of the two, right? Where we physically meet, but we still have a, a way for people that cannot travel that they can also attend remotely, so we mix the two, the two things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a perfect, a perfect addition to the, the live events um, that may take place next year then, um, more successfully again. Are there other 
feedbacks um, also regarding the, the future trends in tribology, for example, where would you see in your in your research area some some future trends or, or things Chiara, please. Um, maybe I just want to have a, a comment. So I have now organized two types of events like this, and I'm a, I'm a big fan. I also miss the uncomfortable chairs at that coffee of conferences, but I've also attended more conferences this year than I've ever done before or in the last four or five years because I, having two kids, it was an absolute logistical nightmare. So I really hope that they continue, um, you know, as a mix of, of the two. Um, but so there's there's a thing I, I I want to invite everyone to maybe think of like new and different formats and how we can make the online type of events as uh, uh, inclusive and uh, and maybe uh, as um, uh, enjoyable for everyone. So there is one aspect which I think is quite important that in theory with the online event we one could really be extremely inclusive because there's maybe people from certain countries who can hardly travel to the US for the big conference. And I think we've all been maybe a little bit lazy in this respect because it's easy to invite, you know, the friends and the usual suspects. So I think maybe going forward, this online format could really be a very a way of, of having really inclusive events from people, people around the world. So, I, um, in, so I, I think that's something that I will definitely think about for the next event to organize. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chiara. Anybody else? If this is not the case, um, then I would like to say a big thank you also to our main organizer, Stefan Eder, who did a great job. So Stefan, this was uh, amazing. Um, also the idea to actually involve your kids in the story it was so kind and so cute. By the way, um, sorry to I cut you off, Carsten. Uh, you can't yeah. see it because my webcam will only do either the live stream or the, the go to meeting. So actually the other people in the meeting can't see me. Gwen's right next to me. Uh, I hope she's not picking her nose. No, she's not good. So <laughs> sorry, sorry. So uh, <laughs> did you want to say anything to the people? She she and Toby both were really happy. They they didn't need any any asking from my side they were all over you okay and they read through the through the words and through your cvs and everything they were so happy to be able to do a couple of the announcements so and i'm very proud of them i mean at seven at nine they i must say they probably did a better job than i did and i don't know they're the digital natives i'm just learning this okay so <laughs> Actually, those of you who are also have the live stream so where you can actually see Gwen giggling here. So uh, oh, great, great job, great job. Yeah, and I'd also like to thank well my team here. Yeah, I'd like to thank Carsten for actually putting this bug into my mind because at first I wasn't sure if I really wanted to follow through with it, but now that I did it, I see there there's so much that I learned that it was absolutely worth the ride. And I really, I'm really so happy that basically from the time that I resolved that I would really uh, do this, it took about two days to get all of you on board. And for that, I'm incredibly thankful that all it took was an email. And I, I think Jean-Francois was the first one. Five minutes later, he said, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that is just great to get. I mean, I don't know how many ERC grantees we have here, but I think we have a majority of ERC grantees. Yeah. So, uh, oh, have, yeah, yeah so, so this is, you aren't the small time people. This is really, this is really creme de la creme. And I'm very thankful for you guys basically doing us this favor and, uh, and, and giving us this chance to disseminate really current, uh, current results for free. I mean, it's actually anarchistic, if you will. Yeah. And I hope nobody gets angry at us because this is all for free. But I think it will probably settle to some sort of a hybrid uh, version where there will be paid events where you get extra for paying and then there has to be some some way of just keeping science very free and very accessible and 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 very let's say uh permeable in in both directions and for that i would like you i would like to thank you very much for participating in this experiment for me it was a blast yeah, maybe just a little final remark um, as Martin Dean Diebel from KIT and also Lucia Nicola from Padua and Delft University um, missed um, our session today. Um, there will be anyway um, the answering of the questions by both of them in the comment line of the channel. 
So the question will be answered. And um, of course, we are also planning to go ahead with our VideoMat channel for the upcoming year. And there we would like to address um, young scientists, uh, younger postdocs that also fits in what Lars said before. So we would like to encourage the younger ones um, uh, who had uh, a big drawback this year and big disadvantage this year to give them a scene, to give them a stage where they can perform, where they can also meet people, where I would like also to have uh, some of you guys and girls again on board, um, where we can have some discussions and uh, further details how we will manage that will come soon from Stefan and uh, my side. And we would be glad if you could uh, just forward the information to your students um, to make them aware of uh, this format and um, to tell them that the next year um, they will be also involved in, in our channel at least where they can present the latest uh, scientific results. So thanks again very much. I know that you are all busy and it was an exhaustive year for, for different reasons, uh, mainly for the pandemic crisis, but also as Chiara said, um, much more participations in virtual conferences as uh, she ever had before in the live section. But um, the more I'm, I'm very grateful and thankful that you, that you found the time to participate today. Thanks again and stay safe. Um, I wish you all a Merry Christmas, um, also to the people listening to us and a good start into the new year under the given restrictions and limitations, um, but uh, most important is to stay safe and healthy. Thanks again. All right. I invite all the speakers you, bye -bye. To, to, to wave their bye-byes, and I'm going to say bye-bye to uh, our viewers. So, whoops, that's the wrong one. Here we go. There we go. So this is the outro screen. This wraps up my first attempt at online conferencing. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, I will let you know though that it still makes sense uh, to subscribe to the channel so we can inform you when we do our round next year as Carsten already said. Uh, so until then, I ask you all to stay healthy and curious and bye bye.